Okay, so uh, good morning. Uh, the portion this week is Va'era uh, in Eitz Chaim, we're on page 351. Um, and uh, whatever, uh, whatever edition of Chumash you're using, look for Va'era, the second portion in the book of Exodus, chapter 6, beginning with verse 2. So what I wanted to do right away is talk about why it begins with verse 2, and also, uh, uh, along with that, uh, what God is saying in verse 2, um, vis-a-vis how last week's portion ended. Okay? So... The first portion of Va'era begins with verse 2. Va'edaber Elohim el Moshe, va'yomer elav an Yadonai. God, in the form of Elohim, spoke to Moses and said to him, I am Adonai. I am yud heh vav -Hey. So Elohim speaks and says to Moses that Elohim is Adonai. So that's confusing already. In other words, if Elohim is saying that Elohim's name is Adonai, Elohim's name is Adonai, then why doesn't it start by the bear Adonai El Moshe by Yomari Love on the Adonai? That would make sense. Adonai speaks to Moses and says, My name is Adonai. Why is it worded? Elohim speaks to Moses and says, my name is yod heh vav -Hey. Okay, so that's, think about that. And now hold your place here. And we have to look back at the end of the book of, at the end of the portion Shemot, which in the Eitz Chaim is on page 341. You want to look to chapter six, verse one. Okay, <laughs> so, Va'era begins right here, but in chapter verse divisions, Va'era is chapter 6, verse 2. What about chapter 6, verse 1? Why doesn't the portion start at the beginning of chapter 6? So to make things more complicated, here at the start of chapter 6 on 341, and remember, we would not be aware of this in just the normal reading of the Parsha from week to week. Um, one other person joining. So, um, okay. So what we're doing is we just read the first verse of Va'era where Elohim speaks to Moses and says uh, that God's name is yod heh vav -Hey. So why is that? And also, why are we starting with verse 2? Why couldn't we start with verse 1 of chapter 6? And if we look at the end of last week's portion, right, which, uh, as I was saying, uh, we don't necessarily think about. We think of portions as independent units, but they are not independent. These, um, it's one, it's one continuing uh, narrative and story. Okay, so um, the commentators um, assumed that we have all read through the entire Torah already. All right, and that when even though Va'era starts on three fifty one, we're keeping in mind how last week's portion ended. Okay, so again, ver first verse of Va'era, Elohim speaks to Moses and says. That Elohim's name is Yud Hey Vav -Hey, which I think is unusual. And then we turn back to 341 to the first verse of chapter 6. Vayomer Adonai El Moshe. Adonai speaks to Moses. Atatir Ed, now you will see. Asher Eesela Pharaoh, what I will do to Pharaoh, because or or that with a uh, that with a uh, mighty arm he will send you out and with a uh, strong arm 
he will drive you out from his land. Okay, so now, so chapter 6, verse 1, Adonai speaks to Moses. Chapter 6, verse 2, the very next sentence, page 351, by the bear Elohim El Moshe. So why is why why does that happen? God is already speaking to Moses uh, and says, as Adonai, I'm going to, you're going to see how the how Pharaoh is going to uh, send you out. And then the very next sentence, Elohim is speaking to Moses. Whoa, what is going on here? And, and then says, so Adonai speaks to Moses, chapter 6, verse 1, the end of last week's portion. Elohim speaks to Moses. The very next sentence, Elohim is speaking to Moses. Is God speaking out of two sides of God's mouth? Is God a split personality that Adonai is speaking and then Elohim is speaking? And then when Elohim speaks, Elohim says, my name is Adonai. Whoa, so what is it? So one, let, let's look below the line on page 351. I am the Lord. According to the Midrash, God has two attributes. Justice, represented by the divine name Elohim, translated God, and mercy, represented by the divine name yod heh vav -Heh, translated the Lord. So perhaps when God speaks as Elohim, God is speaking from a justice aspect. When God speaks as yod heh vav -Heh, God is speaking as a mercy uh, aspect. That doesn't necessarily hold true throughout the Torah, uh, uh, but keep this in mind. This verse would seem to represent a conflict within God in which the attribute of justice would chastise Moses for seeming to lose faith. Why did you bring harm upon this people? Why have you waited while so many have suffered and died? When the redemption occurs, it'll be too late for them. Elohim, the divine attribute of justice, wants to strike at Moses for speaking thus, but the attribute of mercy speaks out, I am yod heh vav -Heh, and saves him, realizing that he was speaking in the tone, in that tone, on behalf of people who have suffered so much for so long. This is the last time that the divine name Elohim, justice, appears in any speech of God to Moses. Henceforth, it'll always be yod heh vav -Heh, mercy. Let, let me, uh, let, we have to turn back to 341 to, to understand the upshot of that midrash, because the end of chapter five, uh, Moses is complaining to God. So look at the bottom of 340, beginning with verse 22. Bottom of 340, verse 22. So chapter five, verse 22, at the end of last week's portion, by Yashav Moshe El Adonai, Moses returned to God by Yomar, and he said, Adonai, Lama hare ota la'am hazeh. Why did you do, why did you bring harm to this people? Lama ze shlachtani. Why did you send me? Umeaz bati, since the time I came, el paro ledaber bishmecha to Pharaoh to speak in your name. Hey ra la'am hazeh. It's only been bad for this people. Bahatzeel lo hitzalt atamecha. You haven't saved your people. So Moses is complaining to God. Uh, chutzpah, you might say, how dare Moses speak this, this way to God? And that's why the commentary suggests the very next line by Yomer Adonai El Moshe. Adonai, the merciful aspect of God, speaks to Moses. Okay, I'm not going to reprimand you uh, by being the Elohim person here, the Elohim aspect of God. I'm not going to uh, punish you for speaking to me this way, as speaking as Adonai, I will um, treat merciful, uh, treat you mercifully. However, the very next sentence, which is the start of our portion, flies in the face of that commentary. 
because now it's Elohim, the God of justice speaking. So how so there's mercy and justice seemingly speaking at the same time. Okay, that's one way to understand. It's still confusing and it still doesn't quite answer what's going on here. Perhaps it, it, it's, it answers the question that the rabbis have in mind. How could Moses get away to, to, by complaining to God so directly? That in other words, for the rabbis, an average person can't, shouldn't speak to God that way. How, if, if, we, if, if an average person or the rabbis might be thinking of themselves, if they ever had the opportunity to speak to God directly, they would never speak to God in the way that Moses just spoke. So how could Moses do that and get away with it? And so they see that since God answered in chapter 6, verse 1, as yod heh perhaps God is being merciful to Moses. Okay, that's one way to understand it. However, we're still left with the, with the problem of why our portion, the very next sentence, in God speaking to Moses is, is saying that God is speaking as Elohim. So let's, let's step back from this and understand, first of all, who is narrating this portion for us, right? In other words, when, when we're told that God is speaking to Moses or God spoke to, uh, to Adam, God spoke to Noah, God spoke to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, etc., who's recording that? How do we know, actually, that God was doing the speaking then? Was it Adam who wrote it down? Noah who wrote it down? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob? Did they write down immediately their conversation with God? How do we know that a conversation took place? Which, uh, if we continue this line of thinking, who wrote the Torah? If God wrote the Torah, why is God being so cryptic in this way and calling God's self Adonai in one sentence and Elohim in another sentence and El Shaddai back in Genesis, okay? Or if we think that human beings wrote the Torah, then that might make the most sense as to why God is referred to by different names that we have different origin stories coming together into this one bigger story. So, for example, there could be different traditions. There could have been different traditions about how Moses became the leader of the people and what happened in Egypt. There could have been different oral traditions around at the time, and each tradition might have had a different way to refer to God. And that when these different oral traditions came together in the form of the Torah that we have, the remnant of the meshing these stories together is the one, one uh, remnant could be the different ways that God is referred to. So, the different stories come together, but the editor wasn't perfect in editing or maybe intentionally left it to, to remind us that there were different traditions about how we refer to God. There's the Elohim tradition, there's the yud heh vav -Heh tradition, and there's the El Shaddai tradition, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so just, just laying it out there, that we have a problem in the text which we may not have paid attention to, especially since the portion is divided in this way. And perhaps the rabbis did that on, on purpose to um, lessen the impact of how uh, stark uh, the different names of God are in this dialogue, right? So it's not a new dialogue that starts in our portion. And, the, and there's a different dialogue that ended last week's portion. No, it's the same dialogue. And the rabbis solved or hid under the carpet, kind of swept it under the rug, why God calls God's self Adonai 
in verse one and Elohim in verse two. Okay, so um, let's continue with the commentary now, just a bit, which now focuses on the Adonai Elohim dichotomy and the and the and what they represent as justice versus mercy. Elohim being justice, Adonai being mercy. A modern midrashic interpretation. So we're on the right side below the line on 351. <clears throat> a modern midrashic interpretation. Why did God speak to Moses exclusively in the name of the attribute of mercy from this moment on? Okay, so uh, from uh, every other time now that God speaks to Moses, from now to the end of the Torah, it's yud heh vav -Hey. And it's not all about mercy, right? God teaches Moses lots of laws. Right, all the laws about the holidays, all the laws about the sacrifices. You might not suggest that there's anything merciful about it. It's all about justice <coughs> or and, and conducting society in a just way. Okay, so it's just interesting. Uh, hearing Moses' concern for those who would not live to see the liberation from slavery, God declared, I cannot judge this man. He is as righteous a judge as I. Therefore, I will speak to him only with the voice of mercy, for the burden of caring for the Israelites is so great, and only Moses is merciful enough to do it. So in other words, speaking, uh, so to speak, with that the merciful hat on, God is allowing for the fact that Moses has a lot on his plate and dealing with uh, the people of Israel could cause lots of aggravation. So but that one lesson we learn from God always speaking to Moses as Yude Bave is that God is being merciful uh, or giving Moses a break, giving him the benefit of the doubt that Moses is just a human being and he's dealing with aggravation. Okay, so it's, it's fascinating that rabbis would see from something as innocuous as Vaidaber Adonai El Moshe Lemur, which is one of the most common sentences in the entire Torah, must repeat a uh, hundred times or more, um, that, um, that, um, um, uh, that from something so innocuous as that, we understand that um, the rabbis are teaching a greater lesson of how God needs to be merciful or how God was merciful with Moses. Um, another modern midrashic interpretation to the patriarchs, I revealed myself as a nurturing, mothering God. That's El Shaddai. Some suggest that Shaddai may be related to the word Shaddai in breasts, which would give that mothering kind of uh, picture to God. My relationship to them was that of a parent to a child, encouraging and forgiving, making few demands. But with this man, Moses, I will speak face to face as one adult to another. I will reveal to him my personal intimate name, yod heh vav -Hey. Moreover, because Moses defends the cause of the Israelites so passionately, I will show this side of my nature to them as well. And you shall know that I, yod heh vav -Hey, am your God, who freed you from the labors of the Egyptians. God of your fathers is the God of Genesis. yod heh vav -Hey is the God of Exodus. All right, so there's that theological component to this as well. Just a second, Lori. Just let me finish this thought. That, um, uh, that it's just not in passing that God's name is what it is, that there's intentionality behind it, and that there's the parenting, mothering aspect that's in Genesis, and now there's a merciful aspect uh, that we see with Moses and for the rest of the Torah. Yes, Lori. Yeah, when they say modern, I'm just curious, what period that's likely to draw from and what rabbis might be involved uh, with so that. yeah uh, well there's one the 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 one rabbi who's um uh, listed is at the very end of the commentary Benno Jacob 
Uh, so the the rabbis that this com for first of all this this commentary was written before the year two thousand, so it's from um, I'd say post World War II Jewish thinkers. Okay. Uh, beyond that, um, you know, the purpose of this commentary is not to be academic, so we won't have footnotes for everything that they have. They have, you know, general. Uh, references to some scholars in the commentary, and that's enough for the commentary to say, you know, we're not making this up. Um, but beyond that, as a Scott, it's not an academic piece, so we don't know exactly what the source material is. But okay. if you look either somewhere in the Eitz Chaim, there'd be, re I'm sure there'd be references to the variety of uh, authors that the editors of this commentary refer to. Okay, okay but they're, they're mainly from uh, 30 to 80 years ago. Mm. Okay, so uh, so we don't have an answer to the yud heh vav -Hey versus Elohim conundrum. We don't, um, it's just that, um, uh, how we understand this transition and why uh, God is speaking as, as Adonai in one sentence and Elohim in another sentence. But we learn something bigger from this, that uh, how the Torah is referring to God is how we are supposed to um, view God. So the, the idea of yud heh vav -Hey being mercy and Elohim being justice is also part of our liturgy as well, right? So that, especially on the high holidays, we are addressing God, not just as sovereign of the universe by using the term melech, but also as Adonai. Uh, throughout the prayer book, that's intentional to refer to God as, as yud heh vav -Hey because we want God to deal mercifully with us. If we refer to God as Elohim, then we'd want God to deal justly with us. Well, uh, you get what you ask for. And if we approach God as, as human beings, which we do, who are flawed, well, then, and we address God as Elohim, then we're expecting to be punished for our mistakes. And yeah, maybe we could withstand the punishment. But maybe depending on what kind of life we're leading, we might not be able to withstand the punishment. So uh, referring to God, addressing God as yud heh vav -Hey, allows for us to understand, yes, we have mista made mistakes. Yes, we are flawed. And yes, please, God, deal with us mercifully. Okay, even on the high holidays, we're asking God to move from the throne of justice to the throne of mercy. Okay, so this is, it's not just a, a theme that arises just from God's name here in Exodus, but it's a whole bigger theme for the rabbis in terms of uh, our relationship with God and the kind of God we should best as expect, um, uh, we should, uh, the kind of God that we want the best results from, right? We want, we, we're asking God to deal with us mercifully, not necessarily justly. Okay. Um, I also want to take a look at uh, page 353. So here, uh, well, let, let me just read quickly in the Hebrew until we get to the next thing I wanted to look at. So verse 3, 351, second, second, second sentence of the portion, Va'era, this is the name of the portion, of Va'era, El Avraham, El Yitzchak, El Yaakov, I, I was seen, or I, yes, I was seen to Abraham, or I showed myself, no, I, I was seen, Va'era, um, Best I showed myself, uh, or I appeared, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, be El Shaddai, as El Shaddai, 
Ushami Adonai, in my name Adonai, lo no dati lahem. I did not make them aware of my name, yud Vave. Okay, so this is, again, how the commentary gets this idea of the, the difference between El Shaddai, the parenting God, versus the merciful, the, the more serious and profound um, just God of justice, God of mercy. The Gam Hakimoti et Riti Itam, I also established my covenant with them, to give them the land of Canaan. So uh, the land of Canaan would be given to the ancestors and their descendants as a sign of following the covenant at Eretz Megurehem, the land of their, uh, where they were dwelling, Asher Garubad, that where they were living. The Gamani Shamati, I also heard, and the Akat B'nai Yisrael, the moaning of the people of Israel, Asher Mitzrayim Avidimotam, which um, Egypt had, uh, was working them hard. And I remembered my covenant, right? So I established a, established a covenant. I um, I stood back. I stepped back while Jacob's children and descendants uh, became numerous in Egypt and became enslaved. And then I heard their cry, which is we heard in previous chapters in the book of Exodus. And so God seemingly woke up and remembered, oh, yeah, I, I had this covenant with them. Maybe I'll start working and bringing them back, fulfilling the covenant and bring them back to the land of Canaan. Six, Lachain, therefore, and more leave in Israel on Yadonai. Say to the people of Israel, the children of Israel, I am Adonai. Right? Now, what? remember, also, Moses asked God, when the people asked me, who sent you? What name should I give them? God said, Ehyeh Asher Ehyeh. Remember that at the burning bush. We don't see that name ever again in the Torah. So it's just, that's also interesting to me. That this very profound name of God, yeah, sure, yeah, I am an, I am becoming like your relationship with me is an ongoing evolutionary process, and uh, how you related to me yesterday will be different, and how you relate to me today versus tomorrow and the next day. So it's an ongoing process. It's a beautiful, profound lesson in how we relate to God, but never again seen. From, from here on, God's, God's introduced by Moses to the people of Israel as yod heh vav -Heh. Okay. Uh, and again, as the rabbis explain it, as mercy. So, uh, say to the children of Israel, I am yod heh vav -Heh. I will bring you out mitachad sivlot mitzrayim from under the uh, sufferings of Egypt. Vehit and I'll save you from uh, their um, from their enslavement or bondage, the ga'alti etchem bizroa netuya uvishvatim gedolim, and I'll redeem you uh, with an outstretched arm and with great. Uh, it says here chastisements, with uh, uh, yeah. It, it, there's no commentary on the chastisements. That's how. Um, it's translated, right? So you have Hotseti, Hitzalti, Gaalti, and then verse seven, Vilakachti etchem lilaam. I will take you to me as a people. So four action words that God is going to perform. Hotseti, I'll bring you out. Hitzalti, I'll save you. Gaalti, I'll redeem you. And Lakachti, I'll take you. Those four words are uh symbolize then and pass over the four cups of wine so we have four cups of wine to remember these four verbs and there's one more verb and that's the cup of elijah we'll see that i so i take you to me as a people i'll be to you as elohim and you will know that i am God, Adonai, your God, Hamotziyatchem, who brings you out, Mitachat Sivlot Mitzrayim, from under the sufferings of Egypt. Verse 8, here's the next action word. Hayiti, that's a verb. It's not really action. 
uh, or v dot m, you will know. Not really action. It's um, it's kind of um, you're not actively doing something, uh, even though it's a verb. The heveti, I will bring etchem. I'll bring you el haaretz. I'll bring you to the land. So heveti is the fifth verb, bringing you to the land. Right. So we've been brought to the land, but we're in exile. So this one's uh, this fifth verb, this action verb is associated with the cup of Elijah, that when the Messiah comes, Elijah will bring the Messiah, will be brought back to the land of Israel. So it's specifically, hey, Beiti, here the promise, bring you out of Egypt to the land of Canaan, is for us when we do the Seder, when we will do it in a couple months again, having the cup of, uh, of wine on the table for Elijah, symbolizing then the next time we'll be brought to Israel under uh, when the Messiah comes. Okay? I'll bring you to the land Asher Nasati at Yadi that I put my hand over, to give it to Avraham, the Yitzchak, the Yaakov, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Atati Otalachem, I'll give it to you. Morasha and Yadonai, as a possession, I am God. I am Adonai. So now, verse nine. By the bear Moshe Cain El Bnei Israel. So Moses spoke this. He repeated this to the children of Israel. Below Shamuel Moshe, and they didn't listen to Moses. Why? Mikotzer ruach. From, from shortness of spirit, I'm translating this literally, from shortness of spirit and from difficult work or from hard work. Back in chapter five, they did listen to, Mo they did listen to Moses. And when Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh, the Pharaoh punished the people by making them have to gather their own straw too. So now the people already are saying, you know, you spoke to us once, you promised that God is listening to us. And what do we get for it? Harder work, not easier work. So why we should listen to you now? That's the upshot of the straightforward reading of this. But there's a little bit of commentary here about Kotzer Ruach. What does shortness of spirit mean? Ruach is spirit. Ruach literally means wind, right? And in Genesis chapter one, the Ruach Elohim merachefet al pene hamayim, that God's wind or God's spirit, how do we understand it there? We're not sure, was hovering over the water before God split the water and then caused it to recede to form dry land on the earth. Chapter one. So ruach is ruach. We we say we say in modern Hebrew that uh, uh, someone has a lot of spirit or passion. They 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 have ruach. But we also, uh, when the wind is blowing outside, we use the word ruach. So it it depends on con on context. So what is this shortness of spirit here? So let's look below the line. They would not listen to, we're in 353, they would not listen to Moses, their spirits crushed by cruel bondage. Okay, so cruel bondage is Abu Da Kasha. So Kasha, uh, hard or uh, difficult, doesn't necessarily have judgment related to it. So the our translation is adding judgment by calling it cruel, translating Kasha as cruel. Okay, yes, when uh, this uh, bondage, <clears throat> bondage is cruel. But I'm just saying that the translation is adding the cruelty to it. The, the Hebrew is not necessarily, doesn't have necessarily uh, any kind of um, um, negative description about it. It's just saying avodah kashan, it's hard work, difficult work. Okay, and also spirits crushed, kotzer ruach. So you could say their their spirit was cut off. 
okay? But it says here, spirits are crushed. I think that's a little bit um, over-translating, but still, it still gets to the point, how do we understand this? All right, so the last phrase can also mean because of impatience and hard work. So kotzer ruach, their spirits are, are uh, cut off. There are, um, they're, uh, they're, they're, right? So you could say that could be understood as in being impatient, okay? So you can understand that from the context I just said. You know, you already spoke to us, Moses, and look what it got us. They're already impatient with Moses, even though he only spoke to them once. So <clears throat> was it because, the commentary goes on, was it because slavery was so hard and exhausting and left them weary, <clears throat> unable even to envision the possibility of change? Right? So if you're enslaved and you have a potential redeemer coming to speak to you, you know, you, part of you could say, I really am not interested in listening to you until my situation has totally changed. Until it hasn't changed, I'm not interested, especially if as a result of you speaking, my condition got worse. You know what? I'm having a tough time already. I don't need you. So uh, possibly the slaves, the children of Israel, are seek thinking this about Moses. We don't have the luxury of time to consider what it might mean to revolt. You know, we don't have the wherewithal to, revo to revolt. We don't have the spirit to revolt. And we don't have the opportunity to do this. We are, we are too busy and are, we are being crushed. You know, so we don't have time for you, Moses, unless you change our, our situation just like that. So you can understand that as, a, as an understanding of what Kotzer Ruach means. So the commentary goes on, or... Was it because they sensed that freedom would, re would, would require hard work that it would not happen quickly or easily, right? That's where the Avodah Kasha comes in. Yeah, th they are subject to Avodah Kasha, to hard work, but perhaps they also recognize that it would be hard work to change their condition. Maybe that's what the hard work is referring to. So there, the, this phrase could ha, is nuanced. Is it just a an explanation of their condition, or is it about um, is it about what it would mean? What 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 kind of work would it would it require to follow Moses and change their their condition? And the commentary goes on. Or perhaps they would not listen to Moses because he came from Midian and had not shared their labors and suffering. The gap between Moses and his people was great. They were slaves where he, has, he had grown up in the palace and had lived in the freedom of Midian, right? So in other words, here's this um, nobleman who is not one of us coming to speak to us you know, so their spirit and, and their work could be re reflected in their relationship to Moses, right? So is it is the, is the Kotzer Ruach and Abu Dash Kasha about them as slaves? Is it about the process that would in, be involved in changing their situation and becoming free? Or is it about their relationship with Moses and who Moses is in relationship to them, that he's not one of them, that he was raised differently in the palace as a nobleman and also uh, as a free person out in Midian, right? So the the it could the kotzer ruach avodakasha could be about them. It could be about their condition. It could be about their relationship to Moses, right? So the commentary goes on. It may be. That only one, <clears throat> only one whose spirit had not been crushed by slavery could be capable of leading the people to freedom. The generation that grew up in slavery ultimately would be unable to take advantage of their freedom <clears throat> and it would perish in the wilderness. Only their children would inherit their promised land. So the other thing is Kotzer Ruach Havadakasha. 
as, as a reflection of the people all the way through the desert as well, right? Often they will say to Moses, why'd you bring us out of Egypt just to have us die in the desert, right? We're dying of thirst, we're dying of hunger, or, uh, you know, life was better in Egypt. There we had cucumbers and watermelon. And what do we get here to eat in the desert, right? So they're, they're always complaining. And it comes a point where, you know, they're not in a position to be able to appreciate, let alone be able to settle the land of Israel. So th that gets to, you know, why that generation had to die out. So this this could be a foreshadowing, the commentary is suggesting, a foreshadowing of what's yet to come for them. That their, their kotzer ruach, avodah kasha attitude lasts with them. That you know, even though they might, they, they, when they were privileged to leave Egypt, it wasn't enough to be able to totally transform their mindset. They still have the remnant of slavery in their psyche. Okay. There is one other thing I want to look at, <clears throat> and that's on um, page 357. <clears throat> it's about the um, Moses. There's a commentary below the line about Moses uh, doing, bringing the signs and wonders and starting to do the, the, the plagues in Egypt, especially with the, um, the first plague of, um, of uh, blood. Okay, so the commentary has just in general a, uh, an introduction to this. Is it magic or is it a miracle, right? Because for the first couple of plagues, the Egyptian magicians are able to uh, to do some of the aspects of those plagues themselves, right? So they 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 make water turn into blood. The magicians do. They make more frogs. The magicians do. So is it magic or is it a miracle? And I I just wanted to look below the line on three fifty seven on verse eight. The commentary there just to get uh, this the Eitz Hayim's uh, 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 understanding of of magic versus miracle, right? So um, the confrontation here is not only between Moses and Pharaoh's magicians, but also between miracles and magic. <clears throat> In magic, humans try to impose their will on God, right? You're making something happen yourself as opposed to God, seemingly as opposed to God making it happen. Right, you pull a pull a rabbit out of a hat where seemingly the rabbit wasn't there before. You're you're as if you're playing with nature, and you're taking control. That's that's what that means. That's what magic is trying to give the impression that we're able to do that. Miracles demonstrate God's greatness beyond the limits of human power. Right, so that uh, as opposed to magic. Pulling a rabbit out of a hat would be, wow, look what God allowed me to do. It's the attitude or the perspective that goes with the so-called trick. Like, <clears throat> was Mo what does, so does Moses or do the Egyptians make frogs happen? Are they doing it? Or is God allowing it to happen so that we see it as, whoa, this is awesome. This is something like, I never knew I could do this, or look what God is doing through me. Wow. So magic, as the commentary goes on, magic originates in the will of a human being to impress or fool other human beings. Miracles, although they may use a human instrument, are part of a larger divine design. A Hasidic comment takes the word words, produce your marvel, to mean produce a marvel that will astonish you as well. A magic trick astonishes the audience. A miracle astonishes even those who perform it with God's help, right? So you go to Las Vegas, for example, to see the, the best magic acts in the world, 
and audiences are stunned by that, but the magician knows what's what's happening. They they did it the night before, and they're going to do it the next night. So they know everything that's happening. But the difference between a, a, a magician doing it versus it being a miracle is that while the magician is doing it, he has no idea whether it's going to be whether it's going to work out or not. And if it does work out, wow! Because the magician had had no power to make it happen in the first place. That God is making it happen. So it's the wow factor that means that the wow is understanding that God is causing the wow. Okay, it's not a wow. Look at how many times the magician might have must have had to work to make that trick perfect. The wow is. Wow, oh my God, literally, <clears throat> what is God causing us to see happen here? Okay, so I think I just wanted to, uh, I thought this was fascinating to try to explain the difference between magic and miracle. Okay, let's end here for today. Any, any comments, thoughts, questions about what we were looking at today? All right, so... Um, so I um, hope everybody has a, a good rest of the day. And um, I hope everyone um, uh, has a good rest of the week as well. And um, next Wednesday, <clears throat> next Wednesday, I'm going to be in Rhode Island uh, visiting uh, my <laughs> granddaughter. <clears throat> so we will not have class next Wednesday. Because uh, I know already my, uh, my daughter-in-law has projects for Lenore and I to do uh, in the house. <laughs> and so um, and that'll be during the day. So I won't be, I, I have to help as opposed to be able to take a break to lead. <laughs> I'll be able to lead Minion Wednesday night uh, on Zoom, but I won't be able to, to teach class. So, so our next Torah study will be two weeks from today. All right. So uh, I'll, send out, I'll send out an email. Thank you. Thank you. Baruchim to you. Okay. And um, have a good rest of the week. Thank Thanks. you. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you.